There's a lot of confusion in some Christian churches about the Holy Spirit. Was the Holy Spirit available in the Old Testament? Is it a person? Is it God? Is the Holy Spirit the same as Jesus Christ, just under another title? Does the modern day gift of tongues come from the Holy Spirit? What role does the Holy Spirit play in our lives? We're going to discover the answer to these questions and many more as I present to you 10 facts about the Holy Spirit. Is He God? Fact number one, the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 states, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Benson Commentary states that the word moved here is translated from the same Hebrew word that is used in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 11 when it talks about the eagle fluttering over her young and the fowls brooding over their eggs and young ones to warm and cherish them. This is a beautiful metaphor of God preparing to bring life into the world through His Spirit and also the Holy Spirit being the sustainer of the newborn planet Earth. Fact number two, the Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' incarnation. Jesus' incarnation is in reference to His divine virgin birth. The involvement of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' birth is mentioned in Luke chapter 1 verse 35. There the Virgin Mary was told by an angel, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It's interesting that the Bible uses the word overshadow here because that means to tower or hover over like the Holy Spirit was described doing during the creation of the world. The Holy Spirit has the power to create. It was involved in the creation of the world and the birth of Jesus. And since it has the power to create, it has the power to recreate as well, which leads me to fact number three, the Holy Spirit converts us. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that our characters are transformed to reflect the character of Christ. The Bible calls this process being born again, and this is necessary for salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In verse 5, Jesus said being born again is to be born of the Spirit, stating, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When the Holy Spirit converts us, His work can't be seen, but the effects can be seen upon our character. It's like the wind which blows. You can't actually see the wind blowing, but you can hear it and see its effects on the branches of trees that move around. That's why Jesus said in verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit converts us is by convicting us of our sins. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 8, And when He has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. After we are convicted of our sins, the Holy Spirit empowers us to repent and live a godly life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit also teaches us the truths of God's Word. Jesus said in John chapter 16 verse 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. There's a lot of different churches and religions out there, and it's hard to tell who's teaching the truth, especially if we rely on our own intellect. But if we pray for wisdom from the Holy Spirit, he will help us to understand the truth. The Holy Spirit also empowers us to witness for Jesus. Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And the Holy Spirit gives gifts to God's church 
to help it grow in grace and advance the gospel. You can read more about those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Fact number 4. The Holy Spirit is a person. There are some churches and groups out there that claim the Holy Spirit is nothing more than an impersonal force, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. But the Bible clearly indicates that the Holy Spirit is a person. Many personal characteristics are attributed to the Holy Spirit. For example, in John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said the Spirit speaks, stating, But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Only a person could speak. The Spirit also intercedes for us when we pray. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. No impersonal force can do that. In addition, the Bible says we can fellowship with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 states, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The word fellowship is synonymous with friendship. Christians have a friendship, a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That would be impossible if the Holy Spirit was not a person. For example, you can't have a friendship with electricity. What's more, Jesus called the Spirit another comforter in John chapter 14, verse 16, stating, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit took the place of Jesus to guide Jesus' disciples after His ascension to heaven. And since Jesus is a person, by using the word another, he indicated that the Spirit is a person as well. Otherwise, Jesus could have used the word different, saying a different comforter. But he didn't, and that leads me to fact number five. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are distinct persons. Some accept the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, but deny that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. Oneness Pentecostals are known for this. They claim the Holy Spirit is just another mode of God. But when Jesus said that He would send another Comforter, He made a distinction between Himself and the person of the Holy Spirit. Another passage that makes this distinction very clear is Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It states, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Here we have a clear distinction between the persons of the Father, who was speaking from heaven to Jesus Christ, who was on earth, and the Holy Spirit, who was descending from heaven. These are not the same person or just different modes of God. This distinction is again made in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, when Jesus told His disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit also has a mind and emotions. Those are things only a person can have. In terms of the mind of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 states, For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. In terms of emotions, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 states, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, even though the Holy Spirit is a person, He is different and unique because He is omnipresent. In other words, He is everywhere at the same time, and we can't see Him. Fact number 6. The Holy Spirit is divine. The Holy Spirit is not only a distinct person from the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit is God. Acts chapter 5 verses 3 through 4 makes this clear, stating, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Was it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Notice that Peter called the Holy Spirit God here. The Bible also said that it was the Holy Spirit, who was also called God, who inspired Scripture. 
I'll compare two verses to demonstrate this. The first one is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It reads, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here it says the Holy Spirit inspired the prophecies written in scripture. Cross-reference that to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. Moreover, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 calls the Holy Spirit the Lord, stating, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so, there is plenty of evidence in the Bible for the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you may be asking how the Holy Spirit can be distinct from Jesus Christ and God the Father, and at the same time, be God as well. The answer is because God is a trinity. If you'd like to learn more about that, check out my video entitled, 10 Facts About the Trinity You Should Know. Is it pagan? You can click on the card on the upper right hand corner of the screen to watch it. Fact number seven, you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available to every believer who has a genuine relationship with God, but you won't get the Holy Spirit unless you ask for it. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11 verse 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? What's more, God wants to give us His Holy Spirit. He is eagerly searching for people who are willing to receive His Holy Spirit and be channels of His mercy, love, and truth in this sinful and lost world. After receiving the Holy Spirit, He will dwell in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 puts it this way, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Since the Holy Spirit dwells in believers, in other words, lives in and through believers, we have a solemn responsibility to take care of our bodies and remain obedient to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 states, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. We are to take care of our bodies and not damage them with harmful substances like drugs, alcohol, and unhealthy eating habits because that will ruin our health and numb our senses and we won't be able to recognize the convictions and leading of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, when Peter was bearing testimony for Jesus, he said, And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Obeying God means you don't have any unrepented sins in your life. Sometimes people write me and tell me they feel hopeless because they are struggling with some sin in their life or have been struggling for a while. But that is actually quite common. We all have our struggles and God will give us power to overcome them. The important thing is that we are aware of this and we don't give up. We need to continue praying and repenting from our known sins and God will give us the victory over them. Sometimes people ask me, how many times should I ask God for forgiveness? I've sinned so much. My answer is, as many times as it takes. Psalm chapter 136 verse 1 says his mercy endures forever. As we overcome our known sins by the power of God, he will show us more sins and character defects to overcome that we were not aware of before. We are to keep gaining the victory over them and in this way, God transforms us into the likeness of Christ. But this is a lifelong process and some people struggle more than others when it comes to overcoming their sins. However, God knows you and your struggles and the important thing is that you're being honest with God and pleading for His forgiveness and power and also doing everything in your power to cooperate with God. For example, if you're an alcoholic, it's not going to help if you keep hanging around the bar. You want to get away from everything that leads you into sin. Otherwise, you're just mocking God. On the other hand, if you are aware that you are sinning, but you don't want to repent, don't expect the Holy Spirit to be with you. If you're living in willful sin, you're allowing yourself to be used by the devil. 
and God won't give you His Holy Spirit. The reason being is because when you live in unrepentant sin, you serve the devil. And you can't serve the devil and God at the same time. God wants us to be His witnesses to lead others to Christ. And if God would give sinners the Holy Spirit, whatever work God would accomplish through them, the devil would turn around and ruin it. Fact number eight, you can lose the Holy Spirit. One of the clearest indications of this is Psalm chapter 51 verse 11, where King David wrote, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This was in the context of David pleading with God to forgive him for murdering Uriah the Hittite after committing adultery with his wife, whom afterwards became pregnant with David's baby. David's plan was to kill Uriah and marry his wife to make it seem like she became pregnant after they got married. However, David's plot was disclosed by God to Nathan the prophet, who confronted David, and afterwards the king repented. But it's important to notice that David knew that there was a very real danger in the Holy Spirit departing from him if he didn't repent from his sins. The Bible calls this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 3, verse 29, But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin. In context, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the devil. Then Jesus warned them against blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The reason being is because Jesus casting out devils was a sign that he had the power of God and the Holy Spirit was convicting the religious leaders of that. However, they chose to reject that conviction. And ultimately, when you reject the convictions of the Holy Spirit, whether it be evidences that He gives us that Jesus is the Messiah, truths from the Word of God, or convictions about your sins, you are in danger of committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You are in danger of committing the unpardonable sin. Because the more we reject the convictions of the Holy Spirit, the more desensitized we will become to them to the point that our hearts will become hard and stubborn and we will not recognize them anymore. If anyone gets to that point, they are eternally lost. That's why it's important to act on the convictions and leading of the Holy Spirit as soon as possible. By the way, if you're wondering whether or not you have committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the very fact that that concerns you is evidence that you haven't. It's when you stop caring that you need to be worried. Fact number nine, the Holy Spirit has always been available. I've talked to Christians before that were under the impression that the Holy Spirit only became available to believers after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. But as I mentioned in fact number eight, even David was concerned about losing the Holy Spirit. So obviously he had it. Therefore, the Holy Spirit has always been available to believers. There are more examples too. Genesis chapter 41 verse 38 states, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is? Talking about Joseph, a man in whom the Spirit of God is. Numbers chapter 11 verse 25, speaking of Moses and the 70 elders of Israel states, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass, that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So the Holy Spirit was always available and active, both in Old and New Testament times. However, there was a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament to empower the church to preach the gospel and encourage church growth. And the Bible indicates that there will also be a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days before the second coming of Jesus Christ to enable the church to preach the gospel to the world and prepare for Jesus' return. Fact number 10, the Holy Spirit doesn't cause confusion. I say this because many charismatics and some other Christians think that they have received the Holy Spirit when they really haven't. Instead, they have been deceived into believing that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you babble in tongues, which no one can understand, or you lose control of yourself and fall down to the ground and roll around. They actually call this being slain in the Spirit. However, these are not characteristics of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 33 tells us God is not the author of confusion. And speaking in a language you, 
nor those around you can understand is confusing. Also, the Holy Spirit comes to help us gain control of our lives, not to cause us to lose control of ourselves and fall down to the ground. Actually, what's happening with these people is more characteristic of demonic possession. Also, when you read Acts chapter 2, when the apostles received the gift of tongues, it gave them the ability to speak other languages to reach more people for the gospel. Modern day tongues is the other way around. It's a mockery of the biblical gift of tongues. It's also ironic how believers in the modern day gift of tongues claim that it's a confirmation that they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit or the purpose of it is to edify them when they pray in tongues, like it's some kind of sign to confirm their faith. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22 says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. In addition, modern day speaking in tongues has occult origins. It was a common form of worship in pagan temples and was well established in ancient Byblos 1100 years before Christ. The Greek philosopher Plato even mentioned it as a phenomenon in his time. He said that a person under divine possession received utterances and visions that the receiver did not understand. In addition, modern day speaking in tongues is practiced by a large number of native non-Christian living religions around the world, including Haitian voodoo practitioners, people who practice in Japanese seances in Hokkaido, and the shamans in Ethiopia in the Tsar cult. Do you really want to know how you can tell when someone has the Holy Spirit? First, I'll start with how you can tell someone does not have the Holy Spirit. According to Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21, it states, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Now I want to stop right here to comment real quick, because witchcraft is synonymous with sorcery. And as I have already mentioned, practitioners of sorcery speak in tongues. So this is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of an evil spirit. Continuing on, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, since we know how to identify those who don't have the Holy Spirit, let's see what the Bible says about how we can identify those who do have the Holy Spirit in verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. When someone receives the Holy Spirit, those are the characteristics he produces, and that is how you can tell whether or not someone really has the Holy Spirit. By their fruits, you will know them. The Holy Spirit is a divine person distinct from God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. He has power to create and recreate us in the image of Christ. He is the operating agent in our conversion. And modern day speaking in tongues is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a deception of a demonic spirit. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like it and share it. Subscribe if you're new and click on the notifications icon next to the subscribe button so you don't miss any of my future uploads. Also, please pray that my ministry will continue growing and reaching people for Christ. And if you'd like to support my channel and ministry with a donation, links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts are available in the description box. Your donations really help. And check out some more of my videos by clicking on the screen. I have a lot of good Christian videos which I'm sure you'll enjoy if you liked this one. God bless you.